Yeah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we are supposed to speak in English, uh, as uh, some of the guests um, are not acquainted with Cologne dialect, um, which was the language I would have preferred. Um, I'm just going to tell you first uh, what I will be talking about, because if I lose the line, then you at least know what I would have talked about. Um, I'm going to talk about an ethnographic subject. That is, I will bring um, to your notice two chants that are sung in the Himalayas. One is um, a chant that is sung by a so-called gaine, uh, um, low caste beggar, beggar from the low caste beggar class accompanied to an instrument called sarangi, uh, which is a kind of fiddle. And the second chant uh, will be a shamanistic chant uh, that is uh, performed uh, and sung exclusively uh, in rituals. Um, the first one, you will hear um, a sound recording made in 1966 by Mireille Elfer who is uh, a leading um, uh, ethnomusicologist in Paris. And uh, the second one is a short stretch of film uh, uh, that I shot very recently, quite recently, you know, when you're getting older, quite recently means several years. Um, um, and uh, then when, this is done, um, I might, if there's time to it, uh, make some form of comparison uh, between the purpose and usage of these two uh, on the outlook, um, unrelated uh, chance. I have chosen the first one uh, on request, more or less, uh, um, I was asked to uh, bring some birds into the whole thing, uh, because Carsten likes birds. Um, so I went through my stuff, my older, older stuff and more recent stuff, and finally I uh, thought, well, that might be something. Um, this very first one, deals with uh, Dafi. The Dafi is a very beautiful bird. It has nine colors, shiny colors, and uh, it in, in Latin it's called uh, Lophophorus imperianus. Um, it's the monal pheasant. And this pheasant um, in life, so to speak, is heavy, not very good in, at flight. It flies well downward, not so good upward. I've never seen one flying upward. Um, uh, so I always ask myself, what do they do when they fly downward? How do they get back to 5,000 meters or 4,500, uh, 2,500 meters? They don't go lower than that. Anyway, um, that plays a, la a role later on uh, both in this chant and in the other one. Uh, but let's first listen to a section of this bird, bird's song. <laughs> Shano, 
चंटू मा चंटू गैरो मा गैरो बाना का भर के को छाना का छन के राना का रन के को तीमी का पारी कुगु पनी लगायो about 300 verses. And the story, it's a narrative song, uh, in, ver uh, in verse, as you feel it here, and also strophic, there are several stro strokes. You might have heard two strophes of it. Um, it is about this bird, who is born high up in the high Himalayas, uh, the bird's mother uh, uh, lays an egg, makes a nest, brings a little chick to the world, and the chick grows up in one line and is 18 years old, and immediately wants to find a mate. And so the bird, um, the larvae, this imperial peasant, goes on a journey. And uh, he asks uh, um, an astrologer, uh, where to go? Shall I go north? Shall I go east? Shall I go south? Shall I go west? And the astrologer tells him, go south. You will find one there. So he goes on to this journey. And the journey is totally clearly marked out. That is, there are place names given. The first one is Mustang. The next one is Muktinath and 15 or 20 names that everybody knows, who knows the country, Nepal, and uh, uh, visits also the places there, and then finally comes down into the lowlands, into the Terai, that is an area where these birds never go. But this is a mythical bird, and uh, mythical animals can do other things than normal animals, although their uh, qualities are very often taken from the real bird. So he comes down and comes to a little village and there he sees a bright, beautiful girl sitting under a banyan tree. And he, he says, no, he doesn't dare to talk to her. And uh, so um, he announces himself indirectly through a uh, Interceded, uh, inter, uh, and uh, then uh, he goes, he says, I must take courage. Then he goes into the courtyard, and there again is the girl, and she offers him a hookah to smoke. He sits down on a mat, and that means basically that uh, she will take him as a guest and not as a, a possible um, uh, suitor. So he's unhappy about it. But he goes on and on and on, and then finally she says, well, let's find out our kinship relations, and they check out all the possible kinship relations which are uh, a hindrance to a marriage, which in normality people also do, and they find out that they 
possibly could marry. So he's at, oh, he stay, he, before he goes to the marketplace, he buys all the beautiful things, jewelry, clothes, and everything for the, for the bride, and gives it to her. And finally she concedes, and she says, OK, let's go uphill. And so they go uphill, and half the way, halfway up on the mountain, uh, they come to a millet field. And the daffy, the bird, is totally tempted to go into the field and take some grains. And the bird takes the grains, eats the grains, runs into a trap, is killed by the villagers, eaten by the villagers, and the young girl is left alone. That is this song. Now, um, the, this bird plays also a, a, a certain role in the shamanic tradition of the northern Maga people and also of uh, some Guru uh, tribal people uh, in as much as uh, the, they wear feather crowns and the feather crowns are made up by feathers of the female gafe, of the female mono pheasant. So shamans, when they go into ritual uh, activities, into seances, they indeed uh, wear something feather, feathery uh, on their head, and especially or exclusively from this bird. And they say, yes, we wear uh, bird stuff on us because we also, in rituals, not in normal life, can fly. So, and this the downward flying of the real bird that cannot fly well up, the shamans explain in the following way. They say, well, this bird is like us. You see it in our crown, but you can also see it. In its flight, it flies down. And where do we go? Where do we fly as shamans, as a rule? We fly into the underworld. We fly downward. But not to get a, a wife. We fly downward in order to find and recuperate a human soul that has been lost and bring it back to our patient. Uh, so now we listen to about four or five minutes of this film uh, where you uh, see these shamans uh, chanting. They chant, in this case, uh, in this film, they chant a, 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 a ritual narrative uh, which was also a, a human being and an animal. Uh, both the, uh, as, as uh, protagonists. Here, however, it is a human girl, unlike the other story, and uh, a wild boar. And these two travel downward from high up the high Himalaya down into the underworld. Uh, in, and the wild boar says, uh, it's very nice down there. You get away from your evil brothers. And it's very nice, I will, at the markets, I will buy you beautiful things. And over, on the way down, the wild boar uh, always carries the girl over the, over the rivers. And that produces some amorous thoughts in the animal. And as soon as they're at the low land, the uh, wild boar proposes to the girl. The girl uh, thinks, well, uh, I cannot do that, I have to do a wild war, it's impossible. And uh, then she has second thoughts, and then she thought, ah, look at these beautiful tusks of this wild boar, and he's strong. Why don't I marry him, and when we go back, we kill my evil brothers. The wild boar will throw them with the tusk into the sky. So that is this story. Let's look at the movie.
Sameni weidete für ihre sieben Hexenbrüder das Vieh. Als Lohn wurden ihr leere Getreidehülsen und salziges Wasser vorgesetzt. Bald war sie dem Hungertod nahe. Da kam ihr ein alter Ochse zu Hilfe, dessen Kuhfladen sich in Linsen und Reis verwandelten. Als die Frauen der Brüder selbst Hexen entdeckten, wie die Rinderhirtin wieder zu Kräften kam, wurde beschlossen, den Ochsen zu schlachten. Traurig überbrachte das Mädchen dem Ochsen die Nachricht. Der empfahl ihr, sich nicht an dem Festmahl zu beteiligen, sondern seine Knochen in einem Bündel zu sammeln und insgeheim im Gebirge zu vergraben. Über den vergrabenen Knochen wuchs der erste Bambus und aus einem der Rohre trat Galdewir hervor, das braunscheckige Wildschwein. Nachdem es in der Regenzeit Kräuter und Wurzeln ausgegraben hatte, schlug das Wildschwein dem Mädchen eine gemeinsame Reise zu den Märkten des Südens vor, wo sie die Pflanzen gegen Stoffe und schöne Kleider würden eintauschen können. Vom Dorf aus machten sich die beiden auf den Weg. Sie folgten den Routen der Schafe zu den Winterweiden im Tiefland, das man die Unterwelt nannte. Sobald sie einen Furt oder einen reißenden Fluss zu überqueren hatten, trug Galdewir auf seinem Rücken das Mädchen sicher ans andere Ufer. So gelangten sie schließlich in die Unterwelt, zu Marktflecken Horei in der Ebene von Dam. Im Tausch gegen die gesammelten Pflanzen war es dem Wildschwein möglich, Barzameni wie eine Braut einzukleiden und zu schmücken. Der körperliche Kontakt an den Pfoten hatte zuvor schon einen Wunsch in ihm reifen lassen. Und so sprach es von den Hexenbrüdern des Mädchens andeutungsweise nun als seinem künftigen Schwäger. Über die Aussicht, die Frau des Wildschweins zu werden, weinte Barzameni dort unten zunächst bittere Tränen. Doch dann erschien die Zukunft in hellerem Licht. Mit seinen Hauern würde das Tier, wieder zu Hause die bösen Brüder Barzamenis, einen nach dem anderen aufspießen und vernichten. So willigte sie in eine baldige Heirat mit dem Wildschwein ein. Auf dem Heimweg wurde die Verehrte von ihrem Freier wieder trockenen Fußes über Flüsse und Furten getragen. Und wo immer die beiden in der Unterwelt gefangen gehaltenen Seelen begegneten, wurden auch diese auf dem Rücken des Wildschweins Galdewir angehoben. Diese Handlung wiederholen noch heute die Schamanen, wenn sie ihre Patienten und deren Verwandte, verwandelt in den Hilfsgeist Galdewir, am Ende der Unterweltsreise auf ihrem Rücken in die Höhe heben.
Section two, and both sections are have e practically equal length. That is the case with practically all uh, shamanistic chants of these people, of these Molan Maga people. And uh, in the middle, in between, in between the first part and the second part of the line, is a short uh, interruption with two extra syllables which have no meaning. And at the end, there are also two. Uh, syllables actually they, they sound like mm -hmm, and one would like to guess that they have something to do with the magical ah uh, hum of the Indian and the Tibetan tradition. Uh, it's, I think it's a bit more than a guess. Um, and so these chants are have a quite a simple structure in terms of their form. Uh, and one has to add and say, uh, as you may have heard here also, but better if there are only two singers, is always one who is the preceptor or the, the, the lead singer. He sings a line with a pause in the middle, short pause in the middle, and then another shaman or a group of shamans repeats exactly that same line. Now, in one single line, you have what we call parallelism of verse. That is, uh, the grammatical as well as the, uh, uh, the syntactical and the uh, meaning of the part, two parts are very, very similar. So similar that, as a matter of fact, uh, Usually only one word is uh, changed between the two parts of a line. Now, when the first uh, preceptor, the first shaman, sings the line, and the other one repeats the line, the echo singer, I call him, 
you have more or less said four times the same thing in one line. And so, so it goes on and on, many hours of chanting. Um, if you record the entire oral uh, law of these people, you would come up with 40 hours of uninterrupted singing. That means about 12,000 verses, uh, that is a bit more than the Odyssey. And they have it all in their head. And what, how do they learn? They learn by doing. That is, the master who already knows what he has to sing and or how to arrange the different kinds of chants sings the first line and the pupil, if he is new and new to the profession, he has just been initiated, he just bubbles the rhythm or the meter. And then sitting from one to the next to the next uh, 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 seance, he learns little by little the whole text of one chant, the next chant, and it takes him seven to eight years until he knows the whole thing. Now, each master, or each person, each person, initiated person, has two masters. He learns from, or she, the male and female shamans there in this society, they learn from two masters. And each of the masters has a slightly different way of rendering the general, traditional um, body of chants. So a pupil learns two different uh, bodies, so to speak. Not much difference, but a little bit difference. Now when he becomes a master himself, he is ma one master of two masters to another pupil. And so that in the next generation, this person uh, already has a, a body that learns a body that is different from the one of the generation before. And so it goes and goes on and on through, on through the generations. That is, by this very simple uh, mechanical uh, fact of the way how to learn it, you have a constant uh, transformation of the chance of the content. The form, however, remains the same. The form remains also the same uh, in all the ritual chants, be they narrative, be they non-narrative, be they evocative, be they about uh, uh, mantras or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, as you heard here, it's always a, a, the drumming, and also the drumming is giving uh, stress to the meter of the thing. Yeah. Or you could also say the inverse, that uh, the meter dictates the way of drumming. That is uh, the uh, entire thing. So, uh, here, and of course, if you make a recording, say, um, now and uh, make another recording in 40 or 50 years, uh, which I have done only uh, after 35 years uh, of a few chants, but you can see how over time uh, the, uh, the law or the, the traditional body of a uh, locality changes. Of course, it changes also from one village to the next as it does from one chanter to the next. And the most interesting thing is, uh, you mentioned uh, that I have been working with uh, drums for a little while, um, is each drum that they have is the same, and each piece is different from any other. And they are always made specifically for one individual person when he or she is initiated. So you have the same type and every piece is different. So on the level of material culture as well as on the level of uh, what they call 
global culture or immaterial culture, um, you have very similar uh, rules of uh, transformation. So maybe I give the problem to you. I want to talk about materiality and the unknown, about dating um, and anonymity. Um, collections have an anthropomorphic and fetishist feel to them. They're both, all collections, are about our failings and about our successes. They signify relations between things and ideas, between the inheritance, inheritance of meaning and its erasure over time. And both in its singularity, because no ethnographic museum is the same as another ethnographic museum, and in its ubiquity, because they're everywhere in Europe, pretty much, particularly in Germany at the moment, the ethnographic museum can be seen as a kind of a household of foreign matter, stuff that is diasporic, immigrant, domestic, bourgeois, effusive, feral, reclusive, rehabilitating, convivial, consumerist, curious, concerned, failed, and obsessive. In the past, ethnographic museums not only collected the everyday, they actually sought out representations of life's unknowns. The unknown, the uncharted, the unexplainable, even the uncanny was part of the anthropologist's fascination with the other. It was a kind of a bug-chasing desire to put the cultural and existential status quo at risk. And in the late 1920s, when Michel Leris famously said, I would rather be possessed than talk about the possessed, what he did was to seek a transducer into the unknown, and that was leaving Paris in 31, leaving behind the conventions and corrections of his own life, and embarking on a collecting expedition with 20 other people that would take him from Dakar to Djibouti. It was a method of acquiring what today we might call artworks, uh, but at the time were called ethnographic. And we don't want to go into a debate about whether it's an artwork or an ethnographic piece. Let's just say that it was a question of bringing back material unknowns. And in fact, uh, Leris and the team, led by Marcel Griol, managed to bring back three and a half thousand objects on an expedition which took two years, during which Leris fell in love with a woman in Ethiopia, uh, during which Marcel Griol managed to remove 80 square meters of frescoes from a, a church in Gonda in Ethiopia by claiming uh, that oil paint would be a much better um, uh, alternative to tempera and getting the anthropologists to literally paint, repaint the Coptic uh, uh, imagery in oil and then to ship it back to, to I nearly said Frankfurt, to ship it back to, to Paris. <laughs> At certain moments in history, the unknown, therefore, that is searched for is projected onto the material object. But it's an unknown that needs to be possessed. It's crazed, yet it has to be controlled. It's unruly, it's tamed, it needs to be tamed, and it has to be classified. And this process doesn't happen in the field, even though anthropologists try. Uh, it's a different situation that goes on, I would argue, in the field. So what happens is that the administration, the writing about objects, the photography of objects takes, is a form of taming, a form of class, is definitely a classification, and that happens back at base. In Europe, ethnographic objects were given a date, it, in a way as if they'd been orphaned and needed to be parented anew. A date founded on when they were acquired or purchased or even looted a date founded on, on, on not when they were originally produced, but when they entered into a relational experience with the colonial museum. It was a time of coupling, which became a marker of temporal identity. And if these ethnographic objects were once deemed oratic, in other words, they held, they held you under their spell, once back in Europe, they quickly lost their original fascination. They acquired patina, even anachronism, and appeared past their sell-by date. And that's what we're facing, actually, at the moment with a lot of ethnographic museums. But you have to also imagine that an expedition with three and a half thousand objects, they come back, 
they're brought back into the museum and suddenly they just don't look like they, they did uh, in Southeast Asia or in the center of the Congo or wherever. And so photography plays an enormously important role in re-oraticizing, if you can say that, or re-injecting these objects with something of, a, of the unknown that they left behind. Over time, inevitably, especially as there's a waning of research within museum anthropology, pretty much at the same time as Levi Strauss declares that really we shouldn't be bringing back all these artifacts, we should be understanding structure and, and voice and cognitive uh, relationships. Over time, the custodian's collection, in its outrageous heterogeneity, trans gets transformed into a very pedestrian series of household articles, which purport nevertheless to be tools of inquiry. And there are hierarchies of objects, that's clear, just as there are hierarchies of people and of continents. And these pyramids of classification, these nomenclatures that proffered capital onto things, the so-called masterpieces that you have, you know, the, the Benin bronzes, the objects from uh, the Baule people, New Britain even, and the photographs that were taken in studios, all helped, I would suggest, to boost what was missing and produce a necessary commodification of that which was never at home. Okay. Um, today, the idea of going out to West Africa, crossing the African continent and coming back with three and a half thousand objects is not possible. I would not be invited to uh, go on an expedition by my boss, the Municipal Director of Culture in Frankfurt, to bring back 4,000 objects from Papua New Guinea, as our museum did in 1961, pretty late. So, collecting for an ethnographic museum has come to a standstill. But you still have to ask yourself, and I can't help doing it again and again, what might, under a state of absolute amnesia, where you're sort of pre-post-colonial, what might a contemporary ethnographic collection look like? Would it be, for example, um, me going to the Galerie Lafayette in Paris, or to Karstadt, or to Gerngross, or to Selfridges, and buying the entire department store? What would happen if I tried to search for, I don't know, um, cultural heritage, ethnos? Uh, if I tried to locate authenticity, uh, confronted with a situation where the shirt that I'm wearing might have been commissioned by a Belgian which, who then had it made in India. It was then sold by a mediator or a middleman in Hungary. Uh, the, the possibility is, it becomes absolutely crazy. And yet, if you look at the architecture of ethnographic museums, they come from the emporia. They come from this uh, very close relationship to colonial goods. It could be, and this is my kind of hypothesis, which we can talk about later, is that the acquisition of life's unknowns has shifted from the earlier speculative and occult interests of ethnographers and their museums, when they still, ha still had a raison d'être for these museums, to the rising market in collections of globally produced contemporary art. Why is the Guggenheim buying? Why is Tate Modern buying? Are they actually looking for risk, or are they looking for masters? to quote Chris Durkom. And what do we do with that which exists and you know is in storage today? So we have a kind of a scenario where we have stagnant collections and the potential actually of rethinking them, of remediating them. In the 1920s, when the blood pressure of ethnographic collecting was at a high, Karl Einstein, the German theoretician of African art, contemporaneous with Walter Benjamin and Abi Warburg, argued very intelligently that the strength of a collection lay in its mobility. In other words, in the intentional curatorial act of switching the position of exhibits back and forth from, the, from analysis and interpretation behind the scenes to public visibility. Einstein claimed that the itinerancy of objects within collections would make people look again understand better what they saw and take apart what they believed or assumed. Collections would therefore reflect, and this is what we all hope, the extremes of intellectual exploration, and exhibitions would speak about human experience and knowledge. If not, he claimed, museums would become nothing more, in his words, than preserved jars. 
they would, and there's a great um, series of translations of Einstein in an uh, issue of October, translated by Charles Haxthausen, and, and Einstein was incredibly vicious uh, in his language, and he says, if you don't have this mobility within the collection, then the museum and the collections anesthetize and rigidify into a myth of guaranteed continuity into the drunken slumber of the mechanical. Now what Einstein was discussing here and what I want to develop is effectively that the museum's engine room lies in the recognition of its research potential. Uh, let's say inquiry perhaps rather than research and that this potential for inquiry lies in its collections, whatever their age. Today, nearly 100 years after Einstein's quasi-manifesto for a dynamic museum, it doesn't take much to recognize to what degree public institutions, uh, just look around the Ringstraße in Vienna, have become entrenched within, inevitably, the corporate culture of consumption, and this on an increasingly, increasingly global scale. And I just want to make an aside because I used the word dynamic museum, and you know, it is extraordinary that the dynamic museum, Le Musée Dynamique, was commissioned by the late president and poet Leopold Sédar Senghor on the shores of Dakar, was opened by André Malraux of the Musée Imaginaire, and managed to present a new work by uh, Picasso, André Masson, uh, but also to do monographical exhibitions of their own artists, El Hajisi sitting here in the audience, and this is a remarkable idea that in the 60s you could, under, you could have a Kunsthalle on the West African shore. It exists today, but it's become a magistrate's court ever since 1987. But the idea of it, coupled with the French architecture of the time, which was to create a kind of neoclassicist cube building on the furthest, most extreme shore of West Africa, uh, with no windows except for the offices which looked onto the Atlantic and therefore onto Brazil, pretty much, that this, this location of the Musée Dynamique was on two vital points on the Dakar shoreline, one where people were hanged and one where lovers would meet. It's very romantic, I admit. Um, at a recent meeting I had with the president of the Musée du Quai Branly, the kind of new ethnographic Mm, juggernaut steamship in Paris, he described to me that the remit of the Quai Branly is similar to being a television broadcaster like Arte or uh, a publishing house. I didn't say Taschen, but I kind of secretly thought of it. The role of exhibitions, he says, is to provide well-produced, colorful, attractive, topical visions of the world with touch of old-style exoticism. That's fine. Let's not be critical. Why would you battle against industrial forms of populist transcultural entertainment? Indeed, the point about it is that the same museum in Paris runs today one of the most interesting research arms in Europe, headed by a French, young, really young French scholar called Frédéric Keck, who studied under Paul Rabenau, is a specialist of contemporary animal engendered epidemics and spent two years engaging before he died with a hundred-year-old Claude Lévi-Strauss. Yet, at Quai Branly, the cohabitation of partner forms of curating knowledge, one for the purpose of public exhibiting, and the other ideational and charged with advanced developments which remain largely backstage, is taken to an extreme. Critical reception, in other words, most people who go to visit uh, uh, Quai Branly, it's very divided. I mean, uh, some complain about Jean Nouvel's dark, cavernous, colored concrete scenography. Quite outrageous. You know, if some of you have been there, you'll remember that there's a sort of a, 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 a route. It takes you along a river, and along it you have a fake adobe wall. And the adobe wall is covered with skin-colored leather. You have to get away with it. You could only do it in France. And along that skin-colored wall, white skin, of course, colored wall, there are little scarification signs which are indications which are a kind of signaletic, a, a way of moving you through the space. Um, the Germans, I don't think, would have gotten away with that kind of architecture. Um, 
So whilst on the one hand we deplore what's going on at Cape Henri, on the other hand everybody's talking about its Mediathek, the library, the photographic archives, the digitized collections, the international symposia, and the close collaborations with global academia. So rather than symbiotic, it's very peculiar, these two strands appear lodged in a hiatus that contradicts the stored capital of this museum, the very fundament of this museum, the reason why it's there, and that is its extensive ethnographic collections. So you could ask, what kind of meaning, meanings do we want to produce today on the basis of these collections? Collections that appear to have reached a cul-de-sac. What role do they play in relation to universities? Why is there no relationship? What modus operandi can we introduce today so that these objects from the past are recharged with contemporary meanings? Because if museums, and we assume that they, at some point, there will be a projet that some museum directors today are not just apparatchiks, but are actually have a vision and a projet, and they want to fight against routine, habit, conservatism, then what kind of methodology can we develop to reactivate the reservoirs, these millions, literally millions of objects that exist in European ethnographic museums today. So to think of ways of working with, curating, caring for, reconfiguring an ethnographic collection in 2014 is urgent, super urgent. It means that instead of obfuscating access to these important objects under a, a very dominant ideology of conservation, you know, you work with fashion designers, you access them, 70,000 objects in Frankfurt. Not one of them is allowed to put a hat on their head. Huh? It's, uh, it's slightly ridiculous. And when you ask your wonderfully friendly and charming conservator why, he says, because we're looking at a thousand years. So best not put it on because the oil on your hair and your hands and the heat could do something to this object. So, um, Instead of obfuscating access to these important objects under an ideology of conservation, how, how can we find new ways of defining these collections and of breaking down the hierarchies that exist between high and low? I'll give you an example. If an artist works with us in Frankfurt, they're going to walk through the stores, and the custodians are there, and the custodians are huge brains of knowledge. And they're going to want to talk about what they know about. They're not going to want to talk about something that the artist picks out and says, what's that over there? And they go, don't know about that, but I can show you a really great piece from Brazil or from South America or something. So um, there are these masterpieces. And these artifacts, which have been relegated on the other side of the, of the board to everyday life. And somehow we have to navigate new, new kind of identifications of, what, of all the other stuff that's in the museum. It's as if um, one could say following Paul Rabinow, that the exercise, and it is in a way about exercises and nothing more, is how to present historical elements in a contemporary assemblage such that new visibilities and sayable things, you know, basically metaphors, become actual, inducing motion and affect. No word remediation doesn't translate into German. It's a very useful one in this case. It, um, it means, on the one hand, to bring about a shift in medium. In other words, in order to heal a deficient situation. Yeah? The word etymologically, remedy, remediation. And these objects are full of deficient situations. You need to shift your interpretation onto several channels, onto several media. It's no longer possible, and this is my personal opinion, and you don't need to accept it, but it's no longer possible. Or to, it's not really possible to be content. I always think of it as being content with a situation. To use earlier examples of material culture for the purpose of depicting peoples, ethnic groups, thereby reasserting the logos of ethnos, ethnological, ethnographic. Or even to rehash uncritically and with enormous difficulty today existing grand anthropologi anthropological ske schemes. I mean, Fritz Kramer, a colleague of ours, quite rightly talked about the difficulty of doing a show on kinship today, yeah, or uh, on uh, initiation or magic or ritual, all those things that have tended to be the kind of organizing principles in ethnographic museums. They don't, they're, they're, they're kind of not enough. 
they're not enough. Well, of course, we can respect and critically integrate earlier narratives and analyses written by anthropologists and area experts, just as we have to take on the existing testimonials that originate from the producers and users of these artifacts. But there's no way you can't tell me that we can't expand the knowledge. You know, um, the problem is that we have to make this collection regain consciousness. This isn't to say that these objects are zombies, by no means. Uh, but they, they are, the curious thing about them is that they belong to the notion of the research collection. And that is, in a way, the beauty of their loss of aura. So, when you remediate an ethnographic collection, you have to engage with discomfort, with melancholia, because there's no way you can ever reproduce the kind of exoticism uh, uh, that um, existed before. Um, it's a kind of, of uh, you know, Batayesque sense, it's a kind of caput mortum phase of alchemical regeneration. You build new and additional interpretations onto these objects. You break down the orthodoxy of the museum anthropological vision. And this experimental fails, phase yields new ideas for works that effectively operate as prototypes. So what I'm basically trying to work out is with a collection of 70,000 objects, whether it's possible to bring them into a new kind of conversation with people who select them and who are not there, or who aren't invited to the museum because they're experts of that ethnic group or that particular thing, but because they are visually highly sensitive and because they're interested. And in re activating these objects. Naturally, it's a slightly heretic situation, but they confer a status of prototype, of unfinished, an unfinished situation onto these ethnographic objects, and they in turn, within four weeks, produce nothing other than a kind of prototype, a prelucid moment in production. And the last thing we want is for people to produce artworks. Would it be possible to keep this running? Thank you. There's a wonderful text written by Jacques Derrida called Spectres of Marx. He wrote it in 1993. And in it he says, as one knows, boule, matter, is first of all wood. And since this becoming immaterial of matter seems to take, he's talking about commodification. And since this becoming immaterial of matter seems to take no time and to operate its transmutation, transmutation in the magic of an instant, in a single glance, through the omnipotence of a thought, we might also be tempted to describe it as a projection of an animism or a spiritism. The wood, and he's talking about a table, becomes alive and is peopled with spirits. Credulity, occultism, obscurantism, lack of maturity before enlightenment, childish or primitive humanity. But what would enlightenment be without the market? And who will ever make progress without exchange value? So what I'm looking at is an effect, the, the, the idea of the research collection that is out of time, that is only powerful in the moment of its own inquiry, when it has been pulled into an, an analysis in a laboratory. How that moment of being pulled into, into a, a situation of inquiry is effectively a commodification. It's not the same a commodification process that is going on with ethnographic objects today. And effectively, a research collection can never be a viable commodity for long. The spectral chain, to kind of carry on this animist, mystical notion that Derrida proposes in, look, in looking at the commodification process with Marx, is broken as soon as the de decoding procedure has been superseded and relegated to a past inquiry. Nevertheless, the objects in these collections, in particular those associated with ritual, ritual, which are therefore doubly fetishistic, retain something. And that something is what visitors in these ethnographic museums are looking for. They're looking to be transported. They're looking for the steamship, the aeroplane, or the hologramic virtual logon into mystical enigma. 
the use value of art artifacts may be interesting, and that's a lot of the part of ethnographic museums is about that. But it's not how the numinous character of the material object is constituted. And Derrida says the commodity even is even very complicated. It's blurred, tangled, paralyzed, apparatic, and perhaps undecidable. Er sagt, ein sehr vertrachtes Ding. So there's a kind of failure that subtends the ability of this mass of ethnographic objects to be commodified. These objects are failures because they can never be us. They are never at home. They can never be an unquestioned part of our referentiality. They are contested and will continue to be contested and their restitution is undeniable. Distance is what makes them what we want from them. We want to them to be a contrast medium to what we know. A little bit like an MRT scan where they pump you with a fluid that makes, it sh makes you show up the other parts of your body. And when you have a store of 70,000 objects, then the resistance to commodification become, becomes all the more apparent and persistent. Why would one, one object dominate? And why would it do so? Perhaps because of a market in tribal art. And the conservatism of a market in tribal art that barely exists anymore, you have to imagine that there are no objects circulating. 20 years ago, you could go to Sotheby's or Christie's in London, and you could watch major objects with provenance being auctioned. Today, if a museum lets go of one of its objects, it goes onto the net, and within seconds it's bought, probably by Sheikh Altani if it's a, a fish hook or a, a, a trap. Uh, nothing is circulating anymore. It's a little bit like serious vintage clothing. At one point, it stops. You're not allowed to swap these, between these museums. Those, those pictures you saw with thousands of objects that have been brought back in the 60s from Papua New Guinea, they were brought back because museums swapped. And in swapping, they could create a kind of quasi-encyclopedic vision, vision of the world. If I go to New Guinea, and Mark Opitz sitting in Zurich goes to the Congo, and if we don't give each other objects from our own expeditions back, we don't like each other after that, and certainly our, our audience doesn't like it. The museum isn't complete. If you break that market lineage, the provenance that fetishizes who owned what mask when, who stroked which sculpture, who brought the object into a relationship of affinity and was transported through it like a Ouija board seance on that very table that Marx and Derrida refer to as a figurante in a play, then something begins to happen. The commodified tribal art object suddenly shows itself up it's naked, orphan-like status, it's out of time, and it's out of joint. These are effectively, these ethnographic collections, fugitive works of art in fugitive collections. Because as Saskia Sassen would say, the object is a migrant too. It has partial knowledge, it has political identities, and it has incompleteness. And so, you could argue that the major claims for restitution for returning the millions of objects. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah? I counted four million ethnographic objects in German museums. So add to that Austria, Spain, Belgium, Britain, what else? Portugal, Holland, huh? Switzerland. And Switzerland. They were good, the missionaries. So the, the, you could argue that the claims for restitution, for returning the millions of objects to where they once came from, is currently the most active form of commodification that is taking place. The relic diplomacy actions surrounding these artifacts insist that the material object should be sent back to the source community, even if these are so radically displaced that no one can be sure that a receiver will be there to welcome them. So what's the point of sending all the Fijian stuff back to Fiji when there's this bigger Fijian community in London, right? I mean, that's kind of, so what do we do? What do we do? I'm going to have to quote Boyce. I'm sorry, he's always under, kind of perennially out of favor. But he did say in 1975, Das Museum könnte auch das erste Modell einer permanenten Konferenz für kulturelle Fragen werden. So I want to make museums into universities, which practically or basically have a department of objects. The museum could be the very first model for a permanent conference on cultural questions. So I have spent four years 
exploring what it means to work with 70,000 objects in an ethnographic museum in Germany. In Britain, there is the Sainsbury Centre in Norwich, where they do research on various tribal art objects. Otherwise, the British Museum has sucked in everything that was in the Museum of Mankind. In France, they have the Quai Branly. In Germany, they continue with 50 museums and a rather antiquated presentation um, and a, an extra extraordinary sort of like putting your heels in the ground and not wanting to change the way that you're working with this. And it's about explication. The president of Quai Branly said to me, but of course the Humboldt Forum in Berlin won't work, simply because the, the model, the paradigm of German museum ethnography and anthropology is explication. And we know from doing our homework that explication is not interesting. It's ideologically um, contaminated in many ways. And what you want is to set people off on a kind of a search. And for that, explication has to be minimized. At least I think so. I believe that what you can do with this kind of material is create a new kind of museum university. Uh, a hybrid formulation of an art college, a university, and a museum, which is geared to accommodate new professional formations. Now, if you break down the elements that require attention today, and this is a kind of way of concluding, and that might constitute the foundation of a new kind of place to work in, why not? Why shouldn't we think of new places to work in? Then these are the elements or the, the, the questions that could be brought up. Because it's always curious, certainly for me, to think about what constitutes the formation of an institution. And I only came back to the Ethnographic Museum, museum because I had started working on research collections. And I was curious as to why in the years 2000, artists hadn't given back works to their alma mater because those alma maters had, in some cases, take Yale or Cooper Union, had been activated by banks of works that had been given by artists and that had founded, if you like, or pr provided a foundation stone for a new kind of formalization uh, and institution. So if you break it down, the first element we have is literally millions of objects collected from around the world that sit today in the stores of ethnographic museums. Uh, I've said already 4 million in Germany, multiply it. Um, I would dare to say, and it's a little bit of a polemic, but I dare to say that these are artworks. I don't want to make a division whether it's an ethnographic artifact or an artwork. It doesn't interest me. Whatever it is, it's super significant today. It's the only area where there are global collections of historical material. I don't care if you want to explain them away that this tribe sleeps and eats and thinks and produces these kinds of foods and, and lives in a hut. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in a kind of interface between how people are moving today, how, how people identify their own historical pasts. And I'm convinced that this can be done if you bring these objects together with the newer disciplines that are hybrid, that are annexed onto universities and art schools, which are cultural studies, post-colonial studies, museum studies, critical anti-colonial studies. You know, I mean, there are billions of them. And the key about these young people who are studying these things and all want to, of course, take the motorway and run a museum of contemporary art, the key about it is that they're not in Birmingham. It's, we've gone way beyond Stuart Hall and Dick Hepditch writing about, you know, subculture and diasporic histories in Birmingham. These, you can study this in Dakar, you can study this in Jogjakarta. You can study all of these new hybrid disciplines in practically every major city of the world today. And then you have, and this is maybe where I, I end, the whole question of collecting that's going on. And the collecting that isn't state-run, or we could qualify that, is state-run public institutions like Tate, but you have private collectors and this enormously powerful moment where, for example, in Indonesia, the, the private collectors way override any idea of new state collecting, any even idea of working in a museum. 
So when I heard Chris Durkon speak a couple of times recently about how Tate is now becoming very global and showing maps of the world, I was fascinated and talked to him about it. And I said, hey, guy, you, you're going in and you're buying risk. You're buying the unknown. You're buying life's unknowns. Because there's nothing more you can buy than, in a way, an investment into that which is not yet captivated and that might be taking place in art practice. And he answered me, no, no, no. We are buying masters. We don't buy risk. We buy masters. So eventually, after three years of research, we will buy Meshach Gaba. We will buy Ibrahim al Salahi. And so I make a plea for the research collection. I make a plea for a collection that is out of the market and out of time, that is always going to be contingent on the precise moment of a kind of prototypical research. And then it will kind of fade in its reference. Um, and it will be waiting there for other people to maybe rethink it at some moment in time, put it into a new kind of configuration and a new assemblage. Thank you very much.